eyes are besieged. Imran Khan watches the rise of a new political party, Istikhame Pakistan, and hops around the country to secure bails for many of the 150 cases filed against him by the government. The former prime minister also continues to wage a grave existential campaign. Although on the face of it, much of the street ferment in the aftermath of his arrest on May 9th has subsided, the political and cultural tensions have merely shifted a level deeper in a country also facing a near-terminal economic crisis. To understand how the situation is unfolding in Pakistan, my entire report spoke to Rauf Hassan, a well-known political and security strategist the founder and chief executive of the Regional Peace Institute, as well as a supporter of and former special advisor to Khan, Rauf Hassan. You know, let's begin with the exodus of our 100 key allies of Mr. Khan's from the PTI. How damaging is that? Because I read that there are two former chief ministers, a former governor, and several cabinet, former cabinet ministers. It, it's quite a quite a drain, don't you think? I, I did a piece on it, and yeah. it was captioned a meltdown and the phoenix moment. So I look at it uh, as a godsend, basically, because you know I, I'll take you back to 19, uh, 2011 when we held that uh, huge meeting in Lahore. Mm -hmm. which is where the party actually took off uh, to what it was to become in the next 10, 12 years. After that, there was a huge demand uh, from across the political spectrum to join PTI. And I was one of those people, the old ideological lot, who said that uh, put some scanners there. Don't let everybody walk into PTI because it is an ideological party given to a mission. We are not into power politics in the classical sense of the word. So unfortunately, uh, people like me will, were sort of uh, uh, not uh, on the ascendant at that moment in time because the basic purpose was you know, that the party should become a large party, which it did. But uh, unfortunately, uh, the kind of people who entered uh, PTI, who were later to become part of the government also, they had no ideological moorings. And they were what we generally refer to as the so-called electables. That means constituency politicians who, because of one pressure or the other, because of one sort of power base or whatever, influence base or whatever, they generally, you know, carry their constituency. Then they're kind of uh, uh, certain winners even before the elections are held. So um, I think uh, the party suffered. The party suffered in a number of ways, you know, uh, most importantly by having lost sight of its ideological moorings, you know, and gone along to a great extent, uh, uh, the, the power politics line. Um, so now that you know, they and it's very difficult, as you, uh, you will understand, my aunt, that it's very difficult for the head of a party to, you know, to even even if he realizes, you know, that a mistake was made and that these are not the right kind of people to be in the party, it's very difficult for him to actually get rid of them. So this to me is a godsend, basically. It happened and all those people, you know, they jumped, they, I mean, those rats jumped the ship at the, at the first uh, hurdle. So today, the party is on a, on, on, a, on, a, on a voyage back to its ideological moorings, you know. So I feel that, you know, the party that shall emerge out of this experience will be a stronger party, a unified party, and more committed to the original mission uh, of when it was created as a political force. What is the truth behind the forming of, and I hope I'm pronouncing the name right, Istakam of Pakistan, uh, a new Istakam. party being, uh, sorry? Istakam, that's right. Sir. Yeah, Istakam. Yeah. Uh, it, it means a, uh, uh, strength, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, the party is reportedly being created by the military establishment, which is ironic because uh, a <laughs> similar thing had happened uh, in the context of the PTI. Even Zalmay Khalil Saad has tweeted about it. What's what's going on there? So, uh, first of all, uh, you're finding a similarity between this party and PTI is uh, it, it's not well founded, sir, okay. because PTI was was when when we started, we were in the wilderness for about uh, 10, 12, 13, 14 years. I mean, Imran Khan was the only member of the parliament, you know, for the first 10, 12 years. 
through the three elections or so, out of which one we boycotted and the other two, he was the only member of parliament who was elected from the platform of PTI. And so we had no support, no patronage. Um, um, while other parties, you know, like, for example, uh, PML, Pakistan Muslim League in particular, you know, they, uh, they, they it's, 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 it's an offshoot of the military, basically. You know, it uh, kind of grew in, in, in their nursery. Uh, while we, uh, you know, the, 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 what, what is generally referred to as uh, the fact, you know, that uh, the, uh, the military was responsible for bringing us into power. Um, it, I don't think, you know, there is uh, any real truth in that, uh, in that presumption. Uh, because uh, um, I understand that, you know, we were possibly going to win another 34 seats. But uh, uh, in order to restrain us from uh, becoming self-sufficient in terms of number of people in the parliament, uh, those 34, 35 seats you know, were actually taken away from us. Uh, although the opposition says that it were those were their seats and they were taken away. So we have a, we, we feel that uh, uh, in order to keep us in a, in a, in a position of being uh, manipulatable, uh, they, those seats were taken away from us and then these so-called, you know, electables, you know, were given to us, about 15 of them, uh, and we were able to form a very weak government. And one of the things that Khan regrets now, in hindsight, is the fact that he, he did not dissolve the assemblies immediately after resuming the office of the prime minister. He, he, he now says, and he sort of, sort of shares it with us and says that, you know, I should have immediately dissolved the assemblies and gone for elections again. Uh, and come back, you know, with a majority on the basis of which I would have been in a position to implement my agenda, which he was not able to because, you know, uh, these were not his people and they were not uh, beholden to him. Uh, they were beholden to other forces. So this is, a, this, is, this, is, this is something that he openly acknowledges now. Uh, do you feel that with the patronage of the military, uh, Istikham and Pakistan could emerge as a Important force if, if elections are held in in the fall, say October or so. Man, I would uh, I, this calls for an elaborate kind of uh, response. Uh, you know, times have changed in the last four or five years. We're talking about I mean, this politics, you know, is uh, is uh, old time politics in the sense, you know, that you create a party, then you hold elections, and you, then you manipulate things in such a way, you know, that they end up winning the elections, you know, and then they rule, and then you know they are replaced by another party. I think the level of awareness which has been generated primarily because of what Khan has done to this country uh, is immeasurable, is in, immeasurable, that's it. So, you know, I think it's no longer possible uh, to hoodwink people, you know, to believe that this other party is, uh, is a party of angels, you know, and that this other party will be able to deliver to them what other parties have not been able to deliver. I feel that the voter today is far more uh, aware of uh, the circumstances which uh, lead to creation of such political forces and also the circumstances, you know, which lead to uh, the demolition of uh, uh, governments, uh, uh, which, which is a frequent happening, you know, in, in a country like Pakistan. So whenever the elections are held, if and when, I feel I add the word if because I still do, do not believe that elections are going to be held anytime soon. If and when the elections are held, you will see that our vote bank would be intact. And uh, uh, irrespective of what happens to Kansa, whether he is still a free man then or he is uh, incarcerated, I feel that that vote bank will stick stubbornly to 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 PTI and to his 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 uh, uh, Khan Saab's role in 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 the in the party. So I don't think it's going to be an easy task, you know, that a party is created. And I mean, if you if you visit the social media, Mac, you would be able to see the kind of ridicule that these people are being exposed to. You know, they're being subjected to, as a matter of fact. You know, I mean, that this was this never happened before. It never happened before. People were kind of, you know, people were easily manipulatable then. They're not any longer. So I feel that this experiment, uh, if it is an experiment, and if it, this is going to go the whole hog as, as you think it will, that means they take part in the election, then they will be helped to win the election. I think I think it's going to fall uh, fall apart. No, it's, it's not my case that they'll go uh, whole hog. Uh, I'm just wondering whether with a patronage like that, and given the, the way Pakistan has operated over the last several decades, it can at least win and rule for a little while and then they'll be thrown out. Uh, that's a possibility I was wondering about. See, at this moment in time, if you look at the uh, political scenario in Pakistan, PTI was the third force, which, is, which was an undesirable factor. 
uh, because two parties are easily manipulatable. Uh, with a third force there, it became things became a little more difficult. Now, with a fourth force, it has created uh, it. Number one signifies a rejection of the forces which are already there, or it signifies the desire to make the government even weaker than they have been in the past. Right. So, like for example, if for example votes were divided among two major political parties, which is the People's Party and PMLN, we, we had relatively stronger governments. <coughs> When PTI came into the into 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 the fray, then votes were divided among three constituents or three contestants, which means that the government was a little even more even even weaker than it would be when there were just two political parties. Now, with the fourth force being being fabricated and uh, understandably entering the election arena, the government is going to be even weaker. That means even more easily manipulatable. So, you know, if this is the game plan then it means that you know we don't know the people are not interested in having genuine democracy genuine, genuine sustainable democracy in the country i mean if for example i mean look at the government today we have 11 parties in the pdm and two parties which are supporting the government without being part of the pdm which is people's party and anp so it's a 13 uh, party coalition and look at the way the government is being conducted you know it has lost all relevance in the affairs of the state uh, oh, is, so, you know, another force in the political arena at this point, I don't think there is space for another force. So this party, I don't think is going to fare well at all, even if it if it decides to enter the elections. And I think they're going to, yes, compete in the elections. But isn't that precisely the point uh, in the sense that the army may like this uh, ferment to continue within the political space, even as it maintains its overarching superiority over Pakistani affairs? So that is the reason why this political fourth force has come into the fray. That is the reason. That's I totally agree with you. Right. Basically, you see, if if the motive is to the motive seems to be to keep democracy weak, keep the government weak, you know, and that is that is how they can be they can be regulated more easily, and particularly among the old stream political parties, you know, who who are uh, intrinsically corrupt, and uh, obviously, you know, that becomes their uh, weak point also. Do you worry about the? hollowing out of the PTI on the one hand and very public emasculation of Mr. Khan on the other and how it might eventually impact whenever the elections are held. See, I have been, uh, this is a question, you know, which uh, many people are asking. I just came out of another uh, 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 program and uh, PTI is Imran Khan. The identification is so absolute and so total that the two cannot be separated. They are kind of, you know, intertwined. Uh, take Khan out of PTI and there would be no PTI, at least for some time. Maybe then there is somebody who can knit it together again, you see, but it's going to be a very weak party. Khan is uh, the face of the PTI, the spirit and essence of PTI and everything else, you know, that uh, a leader can be. Uh, we all have flaws. We all have, uh, we all make mistakes and I'm sure. Khan too has flaws and Khan too has made mistakes. But but notwithstanding that, it's important to know, it is important to sort of you know, understand the, the true essence of uh, his association and his place in the PTI. You know, PTI is recognized by his names. It is not the other way around. Uh, and, you know, uh, let me just take you back a little. Uh, the only genuine intra-party election ever held in the history of Pakistan's politics, you know, it was in the PTI. And I was then the secretary of the uh, of the election commission of the party. And I conducted the election. It took almost 15 months. And it was at the grassroots level. We started from the UC upwards, you know, to the chairman. Even chairman was elected. A genuine election process. No other political party has gone through that, except the Jamaat Islami, uh, which has a, a, a kind of similar sort of election process, you know, every four or five years. Um, these other political parties, they are kind of family oligarchies. And, you know, from there, the, 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 the kind of leadership passes you know, from the father to daughter, a son or to brother or to somebody else, basically, which is not the case in the PGI. So we are now thinking of uh, holding the second phase of that intra-party election and then making it a permanent feature. That means we are going to institutionalize the party uh, beyond personalities and persons. Uh, this is, if this happens, you know, I think you know, that would be a major step uh, uh, forward in terms of uh, ushering in of genuine democracy um, within the political parties, because if PTI does it, then I think it will become a norm. Uh, and I think the Election Commission of Pakistan then should then put its foot down and demand that genuine elections are held uh, among the, within the political parties, you know, in case 
they want to participate in the election process in the country. So I think that will be a very major step forward. But emasculation of Khan, yes, it is going on. No matter what happens to him, whether he's incarcerated or he's out, uh, I mean, we, we've lost about 70, 80, 60, 70 percent of our uh, our members of parliament. You know, we're very happy about it. You know, as I said, you know, it's a it's it's, it's a godsend. Uh, they're gone. And I think we're back to our ideological moorings. Uh, whatever happens, basically. And I think the stress now onwards, and I'm sharing this with you, is going to be on inducting relatively younger leadership. In the in the in, in uh, you know and at, at, at all echelons uh, within the party and you will see this happening in the next one two months time definitely before the elections so you will new faces more dedicated faces more genuinely committed to PTI's ideology they shall emerge as we are rid of uh, the so-called electable lot. I'm glad you mentioned that because I was about to ask you uh, about creating a second or third tier of leaders within the PTI and which. As you pointed out, Mr. Khan remains the very emblem of the PTI so far. Uh, if, if, if there is genuine creation of second or third tier of leadership, I suppose that could uh, be useful in the next year, two years, three years down the line. Well, uh, absolutely. I Technically, I feel that it should have happened a long time ago. See, when we held the first intra-party elections back in 2013, uh, 12 and 13, uh, that was for a period of five years and we should have held another election in 18 and it should have become a routine process. Unfortunately, because of various considerations, various constraints, we were not able to do it. But now we are thinking of restarting the process. Yes, that will throw up uh, 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 leadership from the lowest rungs of uh, the political sort of hierarchy. We, right. we go to UCs and to Tessils and to districts, you know, and then to the provinces and then to the, to the, to the, to the federation. So that is the best way, like, for example, um, you know, county cricket, you know, at some point in time was the best nursery. And we had wonderful cricketers in India and wonderful cricketers in Pakistan who were the product of that nursery. So I think, you know, that is absolutely vital for uh, throwing up uh, uh, a crop of uh, energized and committed uh, politicians instead of them coming only from the from the so-called you know, gentry, from the so-called sort of powerful families or uh, the corrupt families. I think we need to sort of you know, spread it out uh, at the grassroots and you know encourage people uh, to, to start taking part. And men in Pakistan, for example, let me tell you, people like me, uh, taking part in elections or being in politics you know, used to be uh, uh, something uh, you know, uh, we would not even think of. Because we knew that we were, we were, we, we would be aliens to the cause, and you know we would not be elected unless, of course, we had billions and billions stacked up somewhere, you know, and we were willing to invest all that money, you know, to buy votes, which people like me, we, are, we were not interested in. So, you know, we never took part in politics, grassroots politics. I mean, we're technocrats basically. We're here in, in 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 a technical position, you know, and we sort of you know offer our services. But uh, I feel that it's important to know that this distinction, this distinction between a typical political class which has been there historically. To a class that I need to, you know, I, I would want my party to invest in coming up uh, uh, the uh, the echelons. I think that's absolutely vital, and that will change the shape of politics. That will change the shape of uh, the way this country has uh, functioned in the past. So we need younger people. We need more committed, energetic people to come up, and that is, I think, Khan Saab's uh, uh, dream at this moment in time. And he's just waiting, you know, for initiating the process. So. So the way you're describing it, it appears to me that the what I call the messianic model of leadership is probably coming to an end where there is one person and the rest follow uh, that vision that seems to be ending within the PTI. I wish it would. I wish it would come to an end. Yes, sir. We need we need many leaders rather than just one leader. Right. It's important to know we need yeah. because because the needs of people in the country have grown in the past uh, 75 years. They have not diminished. The poverty has uh, poverty has increased. I mean, look, we are today inflation is at 38 percent. It is at an all time high of 38 percent. I mean, how can people manage? And secondly, I think diversity of leadership is also a cause that I'm totally committed to because, you know, we are all prone to making mistakes. We're not infallible. I'm not infallible. I have many, I've committed mistakes, you know, and I will continue to. So a consensus opinion, a, collect, a collection of people, you know, who would all contribute to, 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 you know, making of decisions, to 
formulating decisions and also to implement those decisions, execute those decisions, I think that will reduce the possibility of making mistakes. Uh, so I think collective leadership possibly is a cause, you know, that we should espouse more passionately than we have in the past. And But with the induction of this younger lot that we are totally committed to bringing in, I think we would be taking the first step to, to, to achieving that objective, you know, in the next maybe four, five, six years' time. I was going through your Twitter feed and I came across this very compelling uh, construct uh, in that way. It's sort of a cry against, to quote you, perpetration of crime, barbarity, and fascism, unquote. Is that a cry in the wilderness or you think it's it's uh, making an impact? Uh, Mayank, I know that you are you're kind of into literature. I'm into literature. So people yeah. like you and I, you know, we never lose hope. No. <laughs> we, 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 we have dreams, you know. We have very deeply etched dreams within us. I mean, when you sing a song, for example, it comes from within you. It has it you does. coming out. Yeah. It has a bit of you coming out in your voice. So when I write, for example, you know, it's a bit of me coming out, you know, in my words. Right. So, you know, we never, you and I, people like you and I, we, we, we're never going to lose hope. Yes, you know, yes, yes. We will talking, keep trying. Talking yeah. of hope, I'm reminded, I'm sorry to be conceited about this, reminded of one of my own uh, shares, which says, Rafta Rafta Ham Nikolayenge Sailabse. Rafta yeah. Rafta Ham Nikolayenge Sailabse. So, uh, <laughs> hope that. Oh, uh, if you, if you, if you may let, uh, if you may let me sort of, you know, say this. I mean, yes, I think yes, you. I mean, obviously, Faz, Faz has been my my bedside table book uh, from very very young days. You know, I've kind of grown up with Faz. I I, I share the dreams. You know that he. Was uh, You know the. His poem on on the independence uh, 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 on the on the independence of uh, Pakistan on the partition of the subcontinent basically. So, oh, you know it says that kahi to hoga shabe sust mauj ka sahil kahi to ja ke rukega safina ye gham dil. I mean nothing can describe it better. People like you and me basically we live in this perennial yeah. unbreakable hope. I agree. Like, I you agree. know we will come to the shore someday, sir. Absolutely, absolutely. What is the status of the 150 plus cases? How, I mean, how does he navigate so many case, cases? I'm very curious about it. Do they come up all together? Do they come in bunches? How, how does the process play out? Three days ago, when he traveled from the to Islamabad, he appeared at three different courts uh, concerning 20 cases. Oh. So he was he left Lahore at four o'clock in the morning. He got back to Lahore at midday, midnight. And uh, when after that, I think about, in a, I think two or three days ago also, there were about 13 cases, you know. At the Lahore High Court, for example, he went, I think, uh, uh, day before yesterday, there were about seven cases. So bulk of cases, there are 150 plus now. And uh, if, uh, I mean, this is just unbelievable what they are trying to do. They're just trying to do. Uh, yeah. They want to just keep him running from one court to the other, getting one bail after the other. And... Uh, but, you know, he has steely nerves. I've seen him through years and years and years, you know. Yeah. He, he's not giving up. He won't give up, you know. He has nerves of steel, basically. And he will, I think, if there's one person who shall be able to weather this, I think it's him, Imran Khan. I have not met another person who is as determined as he is. Uh, right. In spite of our fallibility, I think, uh, I think he'll come out. He'll come out. He'll come but out. Of there it. are also mundane challenges that go with it in terms of, Funding this, I'm sure it costs a lot to uh, go through this legal process on travel, etc. You have to have your lawyers and so on. How how are you managing all this? Well, it's uh, party works and donations, basically. And yes, you are right. You are absolutely right. These are the mundane challenges, you know, because because uh, legal help is very expensive in this country, particularly in a situation that PTI is. You know, we are we very vulnerable, very vulnerable. So they know that we need a lawyer. So although we have uh, a bunch of committed lawyers who are also members of the party, yet, you know, it is not one or two or three lawyers that we need. We need many more than just two or three lawyers. So we have to make payments, you know. So we, we, we're going through a very difficult time financially, but uh, still uh, we're managing to gather the funds, you know, to pay the uh, legal fees and all that. Can you not difficult, ask, very difficult. I, I don't know how the system in Pakistan works, but is it possible for you to ask 
our court to consolidate all the cases in one place and then fight up. I know the whole idea is to make him run around, but still beyond that, uh, even if uh, the, the government is in, bent upon convicting him somehow on in one or two or five of these cases, it's better if they are all consolidated, don't you think? Well, we would love to have them consolidated, you know, but their cases are spread out as far away as Islamabad, Peshawar, Quetta, uh, Lahore, of course, and uh, Multan, so many other cities, basically. And I think even if there were, I am not, I'm not certain whether there is a provision in the law whereby you could actually do it or demand it. But I don't think there is. But I'll check and get back yeah, to sure, you on that. Sure. But I think even if we, if, we, if there were a provision, I'm sure that uh, it will not be granted to us. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, uh, you, I'm sure you're familiar with some of those cases. Which one do you think is the most laughably ridiculous? Uh, is, this, is there anything that comes to your mind? If it doesn't, it's fine. I'm just curious. Well, I would say that virtually all of them are laughably ridiculous, as you put it, basically, because there's no, it's just to try to con contain him. That's all. I mean, uh, uh, these cases uh, would be thrown out, you know, in any, any court of law within one hearing. It, they will not go beyond one hearing. Yeah. Uh, they're just laughable. Yeah. But um, I mean, um, he is a person who has never indulged in corruption. You know, I, I, this is something you know that even his worst enemies would vouch for. So I mean, how how could he do that? Um, so uh, they're 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 absolutely flimsy, and uh, they're, they are of course they're. they're the motivation is different. Motivation is not to punish him for a crime. The, mot the motive is to punish him for his defiance. How, how do is, these frequent uh, addresses that he has on the internet, uh, they call it address to the nation sort of thing, uh, is it making the kind of impact that uh, you, you want? Well, yes, definitely. See, at this moment in time, uh, Khan's appearance is banned on mainstream media. Right. No television channel or newspaper can publish his photograph or even uh, a statement that he has made. Uh, when I took over as secretary information of the party, I started appearing on television. They could, uh, they could endure me for just three days and then I was banned also. Now I cannot appear on any mainstream media. My articles are still being published. But I don't know whether my article will appear tomorrow because it appears every Friday. Um, there's a blanket ban. Uh, on Khan, but there is uh, there's uh, my my ban only uh, is confined to my appearances on television. I can no longer appear on television. So this is an alternate medium that we have created, and you know, I, yes, on social media, uh, the reach runs in thousands and thousands and thousands. So the message gets records definitely very effectively. Uh, but we are moving a petition against a gagging order. Uh, in fact, there is nothing in writing. And that was, in fact, the problem that our lawyers were facing. You know, they said, you know, we should have something in writing, but there was none, nothing in writing. So, you know, this is how media is controlled in Pakistan, that they're summoned and they're ordered not to do something and they don't do it. There's not even a whimper. Forget about a noise. There's not even a whimper of protest. Nobody yeah, is protesting. In this day and age of the Internet and uh, very active YouTube slash social media, it, it's ridiculous, absurd to think that you can... Uh, keep information from getting out the way Mr. Khan and a lot of other leaders do. So what's the point of gagging the media at this stage? I don't know. I think it's just making things difficult for us. Yes, that, that definitely. Um, he, he, has to, he, has to, he has to do this every evening, you know, so that he gets across the message to his people, to his supporters, to his uh, backers. And, uh, and yes, it costs money. And money these, under these restrictions, you know, is not easy to collect. Uh, so uh, it creates problems, definitely creates problems. And tomorrow uh, we keep hearing rumors, you know, that they're going to clamp down on the social media also. Yeah. Uh, for three days, we did not have a Wi-Fi at Zaman Park where he lives. So we were, we were completely inaccessible to the outside world. So they can do that. But since there was a lot of protest, you know, because that affected a, a number of localities around that area also. And there was a, there was a, there was a huge protest. That is why they, they, they had to kind of uh, uh, lift the curbs. But they can do that. They can do that. Yeah. Just last couple of things. One is I read that uh, a, a quote by him suggesting that he's open to talking to the military because they are, they are the real decision makers. The government is of no consequence. Do you, what does it mean he's open to talking to them? 
So he constituted a committee. Uh, if you remember, uh, yeah. go back in time, you know, the Supreme right. Court, you know, when this petition was moved, you know, they said, you know, that why don't you sit and talk to each other? <clears throat> Consequently, you know, the government side and we, we constituted committees and they had three rounds of talks. This was regarding the date for holding an election. And unfortunately, though we showed a lot of flexibility, <clears throat> the government side was quite rigid. So they, without, I mean, the, the, the three rounds were over without uh, any decision being arrived at. So now we, he has constituted a committee and he says, yes, I'm open to talking to uh, the establishment and the political um, uh, forces of the country both. Because Mianke, at the end of the day, we are a political pa party. We have political objectives and we can only achieve them by pursuing a political uh, path within the constitution and the rule of law. So we have to stick within the rule of law and negotiations is the best possible way. Um, I'll take you to, to my India-Pakistan dialogue, you know, that I held from the platform of my think tank. Mani Shankar Ayer Saab, you know him, of course. Right. So he was one of the delegates and he came to Pakistan. And he, you know, he's an inspiring person. Yes. And he said, you know, we must all talk to one another. But if we have issues, we must talk more to one another. Right. And he coined this phrase and he said, India and Pakistan, with the kind of problems they have, they should have an uninterrupted dialogue and an uninterruptible dialogue. An uninterrupted and uninterrupted. I, I remember that, yes. Right? So this is his coinage, basically. Yeah. And this is what we have followed at, at RPI, Regional Peace Institute. I see. So this is the kind of, this is, this is what's in his mind, basically. And he says that, you know, let's engage in a political dialogue and see whether we can overcome the differences that we have. Yeah. And uh, the other party, of course, uh, uh, is not willing at this moment in time to come to the, come to, come to the table. But uh, our offer is there. Okay. We are willing to, we are willing to enter into talks with anyone who wants to. Uh, to conclude, my sense from a distance is that apart from Mr. Khan, you have among the most prominent uh, presences on, on, on the net and elsewhere in the media. Are you running any risk of uh, uh, triggering some reaction from the establishment? Well, I hope not. That is my wish. I hope not. And then I am... I am I'm pursuing a narrative, you know, which is uh, qualitatively different also. Uh, I believe that uh, at some point in time, we will have to sit across the table, talk things out, uh, uninterrupted, uninterruptible kind of thing. Uh, uh, and that is the only way for a political party. Um, what happened on 9th of May basically is very unfortunate. It should not have happened, you know, but it was not a planned thing. It just happened on the spur of the moment. It was a reaction to Khan being taken in the way he was taken in. So uh, I hope that, you know, uh, uh, I call myself a voice of sanity and I wrote a piece on this also, you know, that uh, uh, let there be voices of sanity. Let there be voices, you know, who preach, uh, uh, you know, compromise. It's important because I think among the two best people also, there is a need for compromise. Uh, among two political parties or more political parties, there's a need to, uh, for, for compromise. And that is possible only when you sit across, talk to one another and know exactly what are the reservations of the other side and how far can you go to sort of meet them, to remove them. So um, I hope that people like me are uh, uh, left out to continue doing a job, you know, which is um, to the benefit of the country. Um, and of course, my party also, but not exclusively my party. I'm basically concerned about my country. Uh, we discussed it during our last right. session, and I think right. uh, I'd not like to go back to it, but I think uh, uh, we're going to be passing through a grave crisis. You know? I mean, for example, elections, you know, nothing is certain at this moment in time, whether right. elections are going to be held or not. And they're not willing to make a commitment. As a matter of fact, divergent voices are coming out from within the ruling uh, uh, clique. Uh, they, are, they, they, want, they want to hold elections, and they don't want to hold elections, because basic, uh, basically what they want to do is to neutralize Khan before holding the election. They want to be sure that he's not going to win the election. And that, um, let me warn them, uh, they would not be able to ensure under any circumstances at all. Even in the best of times, they can't. And these are not the best of times. These are the worst of times. And they would not be able to do it. Uh, but there is a couple of things that I would like to say. I see that whenever the elections are held, I think they're going to be the highest attended lectures you know, uh, in, in uh, elections in Pakistan. 
um, in the by-elections, you know, the the voting percentage went up to 62 percent, which is unprecedented, you know. And I I reckon that possibly in the general elections, whenever they're held, we will have a voting percentage close to 80 percent or even more than That's that. Right. And that is PTI's strength. All the younger people out there, they are determined to vote, and they shall come in big numbers to vote PTI in whenever the elections are held.